Okay, so welcome everybody to our uh, Thursday online seminar uh, today. Uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, Evangelos uh, Svakianakis uh, from uh, Holland, speaking from Greece right now, <laughs> who is going to tell us about uh, how we can hear the shape of the action potential uh, through gravitational waves during inflation. So, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here virtually. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, an inflationary a class of inflationary models that involve non-abelian gauge fields and how they ability to produce gravitational waves. And I'm going to talk about how they do it and what characteristics the gravitational waves have and what sort of observational tools can we use to deduce or to hear uh, the shapes of the action potential and get some glimpses of string theory, ideally, uh, from future observations. So it's work that I have been doing over the past several years uh, on, on uh, several fronts. So as a smooth introduction, although I think in this crowd, this is not needed, but why we care about inflation is because uh, on one hand, it solves the uh, plagues of the old Big Bang theory, like the flatness problem and the horizon problem. And more, I would say most and more importantly, it gives us a framework for making calculations about primordial uh, perturbations and go out and test them. And the predictions of simple models, which is what has been uh, the sort of early days of inflation and is still used as a, as a useful tool, is uh, simple single field models. And generically, the predictions are nearly scale invariant spectrum and Gaussian perturbations. And of course, the one caveat with inflation is for everything you say uh, is a generic prediction, there is at least one model that violates it. But I'm going to, you know, these are sort of the generic things in most models, if you don't try hard. Uh, so, uh, again, as I said, the workhorse of inflation and something that gives us sort of an intuition of what, uh, what's going on is a very uh, simple model of a single field, a single scalar field rolling down a potential. Uh, the ingredients is just Einstein gravity and a canonical kinetic term and a potential. The Klein-Gordon equation, again, we've all seen it. You can neglect the second derivative, and that gives you the slow roll equations of motion. So epsilon and eta are the two uh, quantities that define the slow roll equations, uh, which means uh, if epsilon and eta are much smaller than one in the Klein-Gordon equation, you can get rid of the second derivative of the velocity. So epsilon and eta in classical mechanics terms uh, encode the velocity and the acceleration of the field, and you can see that they're related, again, in simple single field models of inflation, they're related to the uh, first and second derivative of the potential. And the observables that we go out and look for in inflation, at least the two simplest observables, is the uh, tensor, uh, sorry, the, the tensor scalar ratio, R, which is just related to this epsilon parameter, and NS, which is the uh, scalar spectral tilt, which is related to epsilon and eta. So essentially, once you know the potential, you know, seem to know everything. Now, uh, single field models of inflation have a lot of problems. Uh, and one of the, essentially the main problem is how you get it, right? How do you write down a potential uh, that, is, uh, that has some, some actual physical background? And one way is to just go in the, think of inflation in the EFT uh, way of thinking. So write down all the possible terms, uh, all the possible uh, uh, interactions. That, uh, that you can write down based on some symmetry argument and then uh, impose certain conditions so as to get sufficient inflation. So the problem with that is that if inflation happens at large, scale, uh, at large energy scales, which is generically needed to get a large tensor scalar ratio, then you would get a ladder of Planck suppressed operators that at high energies will become relevant. So even if classically you have a, uh, smooth potential, so a potential where uh, V prime over V uh, is uh, small, then uh, at high energies, uh, quantum corrections will, will come into the game and actually spoil this flatness. This is called the eta problem, right? So super Planckian field excursions uh, will, uh, will cause UV sensitivity problems in the, in the inflaton potential. Uh, and of course, in the, th this is a classical, this is a sort of the typical uh, eta problem, but in the last 
uh, years, this is related in a sense, or so a similar argument comes and spoils our fun with writing down simple potentials, which is the swampland conjectures, which again, uh, restrict very severely the potential we can write down and uh, in essence forbid us for writing down v prime over v uh, much smaller than one. So for the ADA problem, uh, just to get rid of those uh, blank suppressed uh, operators that spoil our uh, potential digital quantum corrections, a very uh, nice or very uh, delicate solution was proposed in, in 1990, which is to impose or to assume uh, a shift symmetry. So make the, make the inflaton field a pseudoscalar, an axion, which obeys a shift symmetry which protects the potential from UV corrections. Well, the, again, taking at face value, uh, the uh, a shift symmetry, an exact shift symmetry, protects the potential from everything. So you cannot write down any potential term. Uh, of course, in, uh, in, a, in an axion model, some non perturbative effects, some instantons uh, will break uh, the exact shift symmetry and create some potential. But again, the, there's a huge literature on writing down action potentials uh, and uh, viable, uh, viable forms that they have. Now, one further uh, interesting thing for a model builder for, uh, that comes as a, as a side benefit, essentially, of shift symmetry is that it restricts very, very much the actual couplings of the inflaton to other fields that you can write down. Right, so essentially the only couplings uh, that uh, respect the shift symmetry are derivative couplings. And here uh, I, I write down the lowest derivative couplings to gauge fields and fermions, which is uh, this axial vector coupling to fermions and this chern simons coupling to, uh, to gauge fields. So even though it doesn't look like a derivative coupling, you can integrate by parts one of the F new news which uh, transfers a derivative on phi. So this is actually a disguised uh, derivative coupling. And each of the two terms has very different uh, phenomenologies and they're worth uh, a seminar each. But uh, just as a quick thing, fermions uh, cannot be efficiently produced because of Pauli blocking, right? And during inflation, they're diluted and redshifted. Although we have shown that uh, they can uh, have interesting phenomenology because of uh, a helicity asymmetry that can be uh, transferred to a lepton asymmetry. So you can actually have leptogenesis from this, uh, from this coupling. And then uh, gauge fields, especially U1 gauge fields with this coupling have been very extensively studied. And why is not? Ah. So a U1 gauge field with this coupling, if you just go and write down the equation of motion, uh, I have written it here for the two polarizations. Right. So I just couple it to a photon or a photon like, I couple my axion to a photon like particle. And what we see is that the effective frequency has a plus minus here, right? Which means that for one of the two helicities, there is the possibility of a tachyonic instability. And actually uh, this can lead, uh, we have shown that this can lead, for example, to viable magnetogenesis if you couple an axion inflaton uh, to, to the photon or to the hypercharge uh, field of the standard model. The problem, uh, if you want to do phenomenology during inflation, is that uh, you cannot sustain uh, U1 gauge fields during inflation. So if they get produced, then the back reaction will slow down the inflaton, and then they will be redshifted away. So it's very hard to produce them consistently during inflation. But it, they, are, they have very interesting phenomenology at the end of inflation. Although, you know, and, and again, there's, there's interesting things that you can do with it, like thermal inflation. So they, you know, there's a long literature uh, on U1 gauge fields. Uh, but another, I mean, the next step in looking into these models is considering an SU2 gauge field. And we know SU2 gauge fields exist in nature, so it's not an exotic form of matter that we are trying to use uh, for some weird reason. Right? So again, I'm writing a very simple, in a sense, uh, action. Uh, action. Uh, so we have uh, Einstein gravity, uh, just a single scalar axion field with the potential uh, and an SU2 gauge field coupled through a churn simons term uh, with this axion. And in this first part of the talk, I will consider the axion to have the usual cosine potential. Although this is not necessary, as I will show in the end, but initially I will take sort of the typical workhorse 
of, uh, of axion physics. Now, the interesting thing with, uh, with SU2 fields that is not there with U1 fields is that they have, they, is that, is that they have a non-trivial vacuum structure. So actually, the SU2 fields uh, can be put uh, in a configuration, the one I showed here, where A0 uh, is zero and AI alpha uh, is proportional to delta I alpha, J alpha, where J are the, these J alphas are the generators of the SU2. So essentially what I have effectively done is I have mixed gauge uh, indices with uh, space-time indices. And the interesting thing with this, uh, with this configuration is A, it has a scalar degree of freedom hidden in it, and B, if you do a rotation in space, then it can be undone by a gauge transformation, right? So essentially you do a rotation and you end up in a gauge equivalent uh, configuration. So one question you can ask, is whether this configuration is stable. If at the background level, if I start close to it, I will flow away from it or I will flow towards it. Well, actually it was shown by Malek Najad and Sheikh Jabari in 2011, that this is actually a stable configuration. If you start close to it, it's an attractor. You will be drawn towards it. So it's an, I mean, attractor solutions are what we want for inflation, right? We want something where the system will naturally flow into. Uh, and typically this uh, scalar degree of freedom uh, psi of t will have subplankian values, right, of the order of 0.1 uh, and Planck. So interesting physics is starting to happen. Uh, we put in an SV2 gauge field and we find an attractor solution with a, with a non-trivial vacuum structure, with a non-trivial background uh, structure that also exhibits a scalar degree of freedom. So if we count the degrees of freedom of this theory, we get uh, six degrees of freedom from the SV2 sector, two degrees, the usual two degrees of freedom from gravity, right, the gravitational waves, uh, and one degree of freedom for the axion. So altogether, we, this is a theory with nine degrees of freedom, of which three scalars, four tensors, and two vectors. So I'm not gonna talk about the vectors at all, right? They are, I mean, I, I can comment them at the end, but they're not important. So I'm gonna talk about the scalars and the tensors. So at the background level, the background equation of motion is uh, only controlled by the axion field chi, and by this Q, well, this Q is actually uh, equal to this Psi uh, module. So we have, a two, we have two equations uh, that you can solve. Uh, you can, as usual, neglect chi and uh, chi double dot and Q double dot, the usual slow roll equation of motion. And what you see, if you just look at the axion equation of motion, is that you get an extra source of free Sorry, Evangelos. You get this extra source of friction. Sorry, Evangelos. On the right hand side. Evangelos. Uh, the which means that you can actually. Sorry, Evangelos. Yes. Do you hear? Yes. Me? Uh, maybe you can turn off the video because we are having some uh, problem with the sound. So we are having some problem with the bandwidth, probably. Do you hear me now? Okay. Uh, do people hear me at all? Pepe, yo si te oigo. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? So I'm going to try to uh, write to Evangelos with the chat. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I can hear you. Yes. I can hear you. But we hear you very badly. Oh. Okay. Maybe you can now? try to disconnect and connect again. It's a zero order solution. Okay, so um, I think he's gone now, no? Yes. I'm going to pause the recording. <laughs>